All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, welcome. We're uh, here today in this workshop to talk about Nina. Uh, there's been presentations in RAC in the past uh, about Nina, and it, it's evolved a lot since then. Um, and I've been using it heavily since I started looking at automation. So thought we'd take another run through it. Um, I've got kind of a script of things I want to talk through. Uh, just to hit like the key points about Nina, but please, if anybody has any questions, interrupt me. Um, we can dive into well, <laughs> assuming I, I know what I'm the the area you're talking about. You know, talk through whatever it is you have interest in, um, rather than just have me talk at you for however long we go here. Um, quick um, thing uh, or, or note on my setup. So I've got a a Rokinon 135 millimeter lens with my ASI 533MC connected behind me with a little mini PC uh, with an autofocuser. So I'll be using that. I'm remoted into it um, using Windows desktop or whatever. Um, this is basically vanilla Nina. I, We'll start with creating a new profile, so setting up everything from scratch, uh, adding the, the gear, et cetera. So soup to nuts is my goal. So speaking of which, the and I don't I have a bit of my screen covered. Does anybody know how to get Zoom to hide this thing, the bar on the top? Hide floating meeting controls. There we go. Okay, I found it. Um, all right, so I've created, I'm in Nina, I've fired it up. I'm running the beta right now, 2.0 beta, because uh, the beta includes the advanced sequencer. Um, it's the only sequencer I've used in Nina. And if you're looking at getting started with Nina, I highly recommend you start with it because it's phenomenal. Um, if you have questions about the, the older sequencer, I, I won't be able to answer them. Um, so I click this plus button here to start with in the, the uh, options general. Everything's tabs on the left-hand side uh, to create a new profile. It's called default with a date timestamp. So I'm going to load it, click load. I'm going to call it um, workshop. And I'm going to set the language, not that it really matters. Um, Auto update source, because I like the betas, I'm gonna change this to beta. There's nightly, which is probably a little bit more volatile. Um, before they went to beta with Nina, I was using the 111 nightlies. Um, and I can show later what it looks like when there's an upgrade. It'll actually, within Nina itself, tell you there's an upgrade and give you the choice of whether or not you wanna upgrade. Um, I'm a little bit, cautious, especially when I'm changing other stuff around, like I will sit on a version of Nina, even though I know they're making improvements, uh, just to remove a variable from the changes I'm making uh, with other things. So, okay, so we've created our profile, we've named it. Um, down here in the bottom, we can tell Nina where we are. I'm gonna put us in Nash Square in downtown Raleigh, because why not? So that is minus 78.643.06. And I don't know the elevation, so I'm just going to set something. Um, all right, so that's the initial setup. Now I'm going to run through the options tab here. So that's what we're in right now. Um, so we've created our profile. We've decided we want the beta. Uh, we have set up where we live or where we're imaging from. And now I want to look at customizations for equipment. <coughs> uh, I'm gonna leave this alone for now because when the camera uh, is connected, it'll change this. If you have something where Nina can't identify pixel size or something, you can come in here and explicitly set pixel size and bit depth and Bayer pattern and stuff like that. Uh, the telescope, I'm going to do a short name, R135. It's a 135 millimeter F. I think it's set up at F2 right now. Um, 
You could, if you want, do stuff like include some um, API keys for various weather platforms. Um, I My typical setup I do, but I actually haven't used it. So I'm not sure how valuable that is. Uh, I do with this um, one shot color camera, I do have some filters in a filter drawer. So I'm gonna go ahead and add those after I hide this floating controls thing again. All right, um, it's really simple. Plus uh, I'm for both mono and for um, one shot color, it doesn't matter. Just name your filters and tell the position. So I've got a UV IR cut filter, I'll call UV IR. I have an L extreme. Um, and I'm naming these just, this is what I've named them in the past when set up for different rigs. So um, you can name literally anything you want. And I think that's it for equipment. Again, remember, interrupt me if you have questions. I'm just going to roll through stuff. Um, all right, autofocus. I... I'm not gonna get into this because there's a lot more to this than I think I could easily cover here. And I'm not really prepared. There's some really good videos I've found on this, which I can share on the email list if, if folks want. Um, but this is where you would set up autofocus if you had an autofocus. I, I think a couple things to note though, there's, um, uh, Let's see. Now, let me let me let me skip this one. And unless there's some specific questions, um, I will I will pass on this. Uh, one. Is there a question? No. Oh. Okay. All right. I don't have a dome. I've never touched this tab. But if you're lucky enough to have a dome, <laughs> Nina can control it. Um, the imaging configuration here allows you to change things like the file type that it saves. I always keep it on fits. I don't know. I think the XISF is new. Um, I'll have to look into that. Um, it's what PixInsight uses. It's like, yeah, it's All right. Uh, you can change where it saves all the files that it's, uh, the images that it takes. You can change the file and directory structure here. There's a lot of options, um, what, what you can do there. And it shows you an, a, an example. Uh, like for myself, I like, um, I use PixInsight and there's a um, uh, weighted batch pre-processing script can pick up key value pairs from directory names and file names. So I'll encode that here. You know, for example, I wouldn't just have date I probably have something like date underscore. So that uh, PixInsight would pick that up and I'd have a keyword for the date, uh, et cetera, et cetera. On the right-hand side, you can configure a bunch of stuff, You know, how far you can go past Meridian, uh, how much settle time after you do a Meridian flip, uh, image options, uh, whether you, you debayer the image in the, the preview, uh, pain. Um, if you want to change directories of where stuff's saved, you can change that here. Um, yeah, I think that covers that. And then plate solving, I've I've set up uh, ASTAP already on this computer, and just I use it for both plate solving and for blind solving. Um, from everything I've read, like that's. That's what I would recommend if you haven't started off in setting something like this up, but there's other options if you have other preferences. Uh, you change your exposure time. Um, you're using, if you wanna use a specific filter, probably with a filter wheel, you could set it here. If you're binning gain, I like to set my gain higher uh, for plate solving. Um, change your pointing tolerance, probably with this Rokin on it, I don't actually know if an arc minute is good or not. Rotation tolerance, if you're using a, either a rotator or manually rotating. And then number of attempts. So I've had um, uh, miscalculated when an object would clear like a tree or a neighbor's roof. Uh, so it's good to, uh, you know, when it's slewing to acquire a target, say not, not to be a, a, a single attempt, 
um, before it would fail outright. So the default's pretty good. So over 20 minutes, it'll try once every two minutes. So 10 attempts and yeah, with uh, two minutes between them. All right. So I've gone through options pretty quickly. Are there any questions about that? We'll get into connecting equipment next then. All right. So I clicked over on the equipment tab. Um, you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff you could connect. Uh, I do have a camera connected. I'm going to pick my uh, 533 MC Pro and I'll go ahead and connect it. Uh, so it's picked it up. I can tell already what the, the sensor temperature is. I mean, it's sitting in the room behind me, so it's reasonably warm in here. Not too, too bad though. As I mentioned, it, it, uh, I didn't change the pixel size in the earlier options because it, it picks it up from the camera. It picks up the sensor size as well, the Bayer pattern, um, all sorts of stuff. I so do. Yeah, sorry, Naveen. So it would pick up all that already. You wouldn't really have to bother with uh, specifying it there in the beginning. Well, right. Yeah. Um, so, so with something like a DSLR, it's probably not going to present that information. Oh, okay. I see. Sorry, right, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I started off with a Canon DSLR and was having. I just plugged it in in the options uh, to to get Nina to use the right settings. Um, I do know that with this sensor, specifically my camera, SharpCap says I should use 101, not because it's one more than 101, just to be safe. <laughs> it actually, that's the recommendation. Um, I can't remember what the offset I usually ran with. I think it was either 30 or 50, so I'll do a 50. Why not? And I don't have DC power hooked up to this camera right now, so I'll skip the cooling, but it's really simple to start cooling. If you want to do an ad hoc outside of a sequence, you just hit this and it will start cooling to whatever temperature you set. And if you say, you know, do it over a minimum amount of time, it'll honor that, uh, which can be useful for preparing to take a, like a dark library, um, set a minimum duration, give it a little bit of time for everything to settle out. So you don't have, uh, you haven't like overshot your temperatures and coming back. I, I like to have the darks as close to the temperature I'm targeting as I can. And then the same with warming, if you want to warm, like turn off the cooling. And if it's been actively cooling pretty aggressively, it can back it off slowly so it doesn't introduce any problems for the camera or the sensor. You can cool, you can warm it up with this button too. And there's processes for these too. You can automate it. Okay. Let's see here. Next, filter wheel. I don't have a filter wheel with this setup, but uh, Nina lets you put in a manual filter wheel. That means, you know, human powered. <laughs> so whenever I want to change the filter with this setup, if I, you know, want to switch to the, the narrow band filter, it'll prompt me. It'll come up with a message box that says, hey, change the filter to whatever named filter you said. And it'll wait until I click the OK button and it assumes that the filter's been changed. Change this again, hide. Okay. Uh, you could, if you wanted, pick a different filter through this and hit change and it would switch it, or, well, ask me to switch it in this case. I mentioned I had a focuser, it's a ZWO focuser. I'm just going to snag that guy. Um, current position is 11,000. I could, you know, we'll go to can move it right here, right now. Um, I can hear a faint buzzing behind me as it's actually moving the focuser. And we'll play around with that a little bit later, assuming we have time. Um, I will point out one thing as we're, as you're setting up any equipment through um, Nina, if it's ASCOM and you need to tweak the ASCOM settings, you can disconnect the, the equipment and hit this gear button settings and it will pop up the um, settings for that particular thing. Um, might be useful to you know set zero for uh, uh, autofocuser or reverse it if you needed to. Um, just it, you could do the same for telescope for camera for all the things. 
All right, rotator. Um, I don't have a rotator on any of my rakes, but I have manual rotator. I can <laughs> undo the uh, rings for the lens and manually rotate it to get to wherever I want. So I'll pick the manual rotator. And I don't have my telescope mount here inside, but I'm just use the simulator just to have something connected. Um, now, remember, we set up in the options initially uh, the latitude, longitude, and elevation. And Nina has picked up from the simulator that it has something different than what the mount has or the telescope. And presented with a choice. Do I want the values in Nina to be synced to the telescope? The telescope syncs to Nina or do nothing? Uh, because I set it in Nina and I want it to be the location, I'm going to tell Nina to go uh, from Nina to the scope and it will just through ASCOM go ahead and set that up for me, which is pretty convenient. All right, Guider. I do have Guider and I have set it up here. Um, Let's see, it's a ASI 120 MCS, so it's a planetary camera. Um, I don't know how well it'll do on the little tiny scope I've set it up on, but we'll try it at some point in the future. Um, I think Nina will automatically connect these through PhD, but I just went ahead and connected them there. And then you can pick here in Nina, my guider is PhD2 and connect. And I have a profile I set up in PHD that's called test. So if you've set up different profiles for different setups, you can pick them here. Uh, I don't haven't done the math on how many pixels I should dither, but let's just say it's gonna be more, 10, why not? Um, settle timeout 40 by default is a really long time uh, for my mount usually. Find 15 seconds where it's better. So you can change all these settings right here and they just take effect. All right, looking down the list on the left here, I don't have this. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, pardon my ignorance. What is uh, settle timeout? What is that exactly? Uh, so the settle timeout is whenever there's an operation like a, a dither where it's moving the mm -hmm. frame just a little bit, it will by default have a minimum amount of time that it, well, actually not the minimum, it's the maximum amount of time that Nina will wait for guiding to settle, meaning for the guiding to get within the pixel tolerance that's set here. Okay, as in like, you know, whatever residual backlash came from the dithering. Yep. Okay, yep. okay. I understand, thanks. Yeah, and you'll have to probably play with it and see what works for your setup. Um, I'm I'm assuming when if I whenever I actually use this, the the subtle tolerance of one and a half pixels is probably going to be much a little too much, but um, I don't know. Um, and likewise, there's also a timeout for starting guiding to allow for settling as well. Um, I don't think I've ever changed this from the default. It's really long, but it tends to settle out reasonably quickly. Um, yep. Oh, and a minimum settle time here. It is tucked off to the side. So if you have, you know, you just want to make sure that it's settled for real and it, it doesn't do a good job, you might force it to go a little long. All right. I don't have a switch. I have used and use a, a power box on a different rig. You could connect it here and control whatever it can do. Um, I've never had a flat panel. Uh, the weather, as I mentioned, you can connect here. I don't know how useful it is with the Nina. Probably useful in conjunction with a dome control, which I have not played with. And I have not messed with safety monitors. Um, yeah, not at all. At some point, I would, I, I would like to see if there's some thing with weather and safety, but I don't know. Because I don't have something to automatically cover my mount, I'd have to go out anyway, so. All right, so all the gear is set up, it's all connected. There's a button in the bottom left here called connect. 
And I'll just connect all devices. They're already connected, I think, but it yeah, reconnected them. That's fine. Um, you can also hit that and disconnect everything all in one shot. And it remembers between boot ups what that profile's equipment was. Okay. So we've got initial setup done. We've got a couple filters configured, uh, plate solvings configured. We've now connected all of our gear. We've got PhD set up, you know, simulated telescope, but you know what, that's all right. What are we gonna image tonight? So they've got a sky atlas, uh, which I've poked at only for this workshop and having, I just really hadn't thought to use it much, but it's actually pretty cool. You could say, what's my, the altitude of the target minimum altitude? Uh, when do you wanna image? So we'll say from dusk till dawn, astronomical dusk to astronomical dawn. Um, just because we'll say at least two hours visible. And that's probably good. Let's search what we can see tonight. You could also pick a date in the future, which I've not played with at all, but that's actually, that's tantalizing. I might have to play with that. Uh, you can see down here in the bottom, it tells you, you know, what's the moon doing that night? Um, how far away? the moon is from your target when you get all the results. Um, this one, Beehive, may not be the best target. It's uh, nine degrees off from the moon, so it's going to be a little bit bright. Um, but let's see. Let's pick Beehive cluster for, uh, well, let's, let's assume the moon's not a problem. I've, OK, so we've got that. Um, I don't know though from here what what obstructions I need to deal with. So I'm not going to get into the details of this, but this is a really neat feature with um, Nina. If you go to Options General, there's an option for a custom horizon, and I created one for my backyard and side yard a while back. And I, it can also load it into Stellarium, um, which I, I use. So um, Let's see if I can just open it up. Is there a open with? I haven't tried this notepad. Uh, it's just altitude and or azimuth and altitude from various points in it. It's like from where you're imaging. I I just put points that like that's the corner of a roof or the top of a tree, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's pretty simple to 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 get um, set up, though really tedious but it works great. I'm gonna show you that. So I've loaded my backyard horizon. We'll go back to the sky atlas. Um, it doesn't load the horizon by default, but if I search again, do, 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 do. live demos, right? There we go. Uh, so now you can see the you know, beehive, which we, I said we we're going to use as the example for this workshop. I can see when it would clear obstructions. Um, and like for this one down here, it's able, I have this color profile is terrible. Uh, 2197, 2197, yep. Uh, if I would have, if I wanted to image that, I'd have to probably look at, uh, is that about somewhere around 50 degrees altitude before it clears whatever that is? Probably looks like a tree or a house, house roof probably. Um, this is gonna be really useful for planning. But the other aspect of planning is, okay, so got a target. I know it's gonna be clear of obstructions now. How do I wanna frame it? Uh, so there's a great framing assistant here. You can just click set framing assistant and it'll load it up. And I know this is gonna be too small. So let's go up. So the focal length is 135 millimeters, which I don't know why it doesn't pick it up, but never does. Oh. Beehive cluster. All right. So it, so it picked up the dimensions of my sensor, the pixel size, and I had to plug in the focal length manually for whatever reason. 
uh, and I get this framing assistant where I can drag around uh, how I want to frame the target. And I'm just going to say, I want to get all those bright stars in the frame, because why not? And uh, I could say I want to rotate the frame here. Uh, let's, I usually run 90 degrees, but you know, with this square sensor, that doesn't matter at all. Uh, so we'll just go with zero. If you want to plan a mosaic, you can add panels here, which I don't have a field of view to show the full thing, but then you can drag them around, figure out where you want to put the mosaic. Go back to one. Uh, and then we can save it as a target. Uh, well, you could, there's options here. You could um, slew and center, like just go to it right now if you wanted to, assuming it was dark, which it's not. Uh, could add a target to a sequence, which we haven't gotten into yet. Uh, but there's a little drop down here. You can add target to a target list. So Nina can collect sets of targets for you, and then you can reuse those over multiple nights. So you get the same framing, the same rotation, same everything. It's really, really convenient. So I'm going to add to target list. Um, I'll explain when we look at the, the sequencer what the choices here mean, but I, I'm just going to pick the basic sequence target uh, because I, I, I don't use, it's basically allowing you to tie a target to a particular template. Uh, I have lots of templates, so it doesn't make sense for me to use it. Maybe it would for, for you, so try it out. And that's it. I think one nice thing, like for some reason, the Sky Atlas view doesn't let you do this, but in the other views where you have the elevation, you can click on the um, uh, the path of the object and get the alt the uh, altitude is the Y here. So you can see like here it will be you know about 32 degrees altitude before it's behind some object. And over here, 34. Um, and you can also click on the horizon to see the altitude of that. So it's pretty slick. Yeah, I'm gonna close that. All right, so let's see, we've got a target. We know that we will be able to see it. Um, all right, so let's get into kind of preparing for a night, if you would. Um, I like to take my flats before I start imaging. Although if you are changing filters, like with the filter drawer where it's going to be exposed to the elements and dust, you want to take flats on all the filter changes. Uh, ideally, I mean, you don't have to, but um, if you want to get the best flats, that's, that's recommended. So I'm going to focus my camera now. I'm going to go over to the imaging tab. Um, now this is the default view. It's got a whole bunch of stuff here. You can move everything around. It's really nice. And remember, if you shut down Nina, it will remember. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say that very specifically, if you shut down Nina, because at the end of my imaging nights, if I've changed something here and I forget, and I just power off the PC, like disconnect it from DC power, I lose everything I changed. And it's kind of an annoying to uh, have to set it up again. But let's just move a couple of things around. I'm going to grab the bar. Um, I'm going to move it to the left of this panel and can size it. Um, let's see, I want statistics to be in the same location. So I can move it to the middle. It looks like it has two little tabs there. So if I drop it on top of the middle part, it puts tabs where I can switch between it. I don't like weather. It doesn't, I didn't set that up. So I can close that. Telescope doesn't help me. So. Pretty, pretty flexible. You can add, it, um, I'll talk about the, the plugins, which are part of the, the beta. Um, you can add plugins that add different capabilities that can show up here. Um, there'll be tools listed as tools up here. There's actually two right here that I've added just because I want to 
talk about them specifically uh, towards the end. Um, and to add a plugin, you have to restart Nina, which just felt would be good not to have to do that. Naveen, this is uh, Don Duhart. Could you go over again on how to set the page up on moving? Sure. The, uh, I, I found a little, I found it was confusing because it wasn't doing what I wanted. And uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no worries. So I'm going to grab the image history then and just pull it towards the middle. It's bigger, a little bit easier to see. Uh, there's, a, there's, uh, let's see, there's nine places you can drop it and it may not be obvious. So there's to the right, to the top, to the left, and to the bottom of the current pane. There's as a tab in the current pane is this bit in the middle. And then around the outside at perimeter, there's as a, just a completely new pane above everything, to the left of everything, bottom of everything, or to the right of everything. So it's, it's like, I, I don't know about infinitely flexible, but it's very flexible. And I actually like the image history to be here. So I'm going to drop it on the there. So I get the tab. Um, I also, if you'll notice it added image history on the left, which annoys me. So if you want to move stuff around, it's by order of how you drop them on the pane. So I want image to the left because that'll be the default. So I'm going to pick up image again and just drop it back where it was. And image is now on the left. Don, does that cover it? Yes, thank you. No problem. OK. Um, yeah, and if there's for anybody who has joined uh, since we started, please interrupt if you have any questions. I'll cover whatever I can uh, of your questions. and. Um, yeah. Actually, I have one question, Jeff. Uh, yep. you, you, I see down there on your uh, on your uh, uh, on your menu bar there, the Windows menu bar. You have a shark tab. How uh, does optimal exposure calculator work the same as Smart Histogram? Pretty much, like uh, optimal exposure calculator in Nina. Does that work exactly the same as a Smart Histogram and Shark Tab? Um, I have not used Sharp Cap much for that i i don't it doesn't work exactly the same no but i mean i think the results would be similar it, well uh, no sharp cap gives you a recommended over a period of time that you're imaging it says how many exposures at what exposure length to take i think um whereas nina if you use the optimal exposure calculator which is loaded here it will tell you for the single, for the filter you're on at the settings you've set, um, what is the best exposure time to swamp uh, noise? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it uses the sharp cap sensor analysis. So I was actually, I'm, we'll, we, can, we can jump into this. Well, real actually, quick, that... Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, okay, sensor analysis, I guess that was the best, better way of saying it. So you would say that it's almost synonymous with it, I mean, sharp caps, sensor analysis, or? Uh, it, it, act, it doesn't do the sensor analysis for you. It loads the sensor analysis that sharp cap has done. Because oh, oh, that, okay. so um, sharp cap sensor analysis, uh, as far as I know, is free. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of the tools within SharpCap aren't, but the sensor analysis is. Um, so use it. It's great. <laughs> um, yes. Um, yeah, I have a, I ran into an unusual problem. Um, um, I stack with a Deep Sky Stacker and I have uh, also use ASTAP. And what's interesting is um, I can't use flats or dark flats generated in sharp cap, even though the settings on the camera and everything are identical hmm. than what is in uh, Nina. It just, in, uh, in Deep Sky Stacker, it won't even start the stacking. So there's something wrong. This, uh, and then uh, if I do it in ASTAP, I get a, you know, kind of a weird final uh, stacked image. Um, and that's, I, yeah. 
Hey, I Don, don't mean to interrupt, but that, yeah, that's actually a common problem with Deep Sky Stacker. It's just something about like flats from different, that are made by different programs. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a PC guru or anything, but yeah, I just know Deep Sky Stacker doesn't like that. Yeah, you have to, Deep Sky Stacker would only have, uh, allow, uh, oh, would only compose an image from, um, uh, image sets of from the, that were uh, um, obtained by the same program. So if you took like darks and shark cap and then uh, you stored them away and then uh, you started using another imaging program and like, oh, I don't want to take these uh, darks right here. I'll just use the old ones I had uh, in my old program, shark cap. Darks, uh, these guys stacker is not going to like that. I'll go ahead and tell you that right now. There's, that's a problem. That's a common problem with uh, these oh. guys stacker. Hmm. Okay. So that's kind of interesting because um... Uh, it didn't have any issues with my, you know, all darks that I generated uh, earlier. But the interesting thing is, with even with a two nine four at at close to Unity, I've been running that two one twenty five. Mm -hmm. You take a, oh, I usually run like three minute subs, and you stretch the heck out of it, and there's no uh, amp glow. So maybe it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you got me then. So <laughs> yeah. anyway, I just yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That that's interesting. I wonder if it has something to do with the headers that are in the file not matching up, or something, yeah. and I can't can't knit them together. I think you're on to something there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thanks for not helping, right? <laughs> it's a problem. No, 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 really. No, it's just, I've gotten some information. Sure. Um, okay, so on a, on the optimal exposure thing. So yeah, do your. I, this is what I do, and you know, if you use sharp cap only, great. If it works for you, I, I've I started with Nina, and I I've kind of don't see a reason to change, but you, you know, load the sensor analysis. It's picked up the gain from what we configured earlier of 101. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I've, yeah, I don't have it referenced here within Nina right now, but um, it would pick up the, the, the full read, uh, uh, full well capacity read noise. And then you calculate a bias, click this button. It'll say, put the cap on your camera. Uh, it'll take a bias shot, fill this in. I think it'll probably for this camera, it's like 512 ish. Um, set an exposure time doesn't have to be really long. It doesn't even for narrow band, it doesn't matter much. Uh, broadband, I would do five seconds, narrow band, maybe 15 expose, and it'll just spew out here like, oh, you should take a you know. 700 second exposure or whatever uh, for some of the narrowband stuff, uh, which can be crazy. And then you can fiddle around like, well, okay, if I change the gain, what will that do? Uh, so it's really convenient. Um, all right, so I came in here because I wanted to focus my camera and it's hooked up, it's connected and it's bright in here. So I'm gonna do a hundredth of a second with the current uh, exposure with the current filter, no binning, default gain. Just take one shot, see what it looks like. Let's see if I took I took the lens cap off. Good. All right, that's not in focus. Where's my focuser? All right, I changed it to six thousand. Okay, so let's do a loop. We'll take. Hopefully, this is coming through Zoom. It's um, it's definitely not in focus if it's not coming through. Yeah, I can see it. So let's move it to, we were at 11,000 before, move it to 10,000. And we're taking a, a loop of exposures um, every, and they're hundredth of a second. I'm gonna turn off the star annotation thing here because that just takes a little time. So, okay, it's coming in focus sideways and move it again. Oh yeah can illuminate it a little bit. All right, there we go. This is a little um, model of a, a eight inch Dobsonian I printed but over a year ago now, 3D printed when I was looking at building an equatorial platform, a project which I 
I ditched after learning more about it. But um, you can, once you have your picture, you can zoom in here, get in really close, um, can pan around, just grab it, move. Uh, when you're taking pictures with stars, uh, I turned off this button here. There's star detection and analysis. It'll show the half flux radius by default. Um, go back to fill the whole thing. You can, if you're centering something maybe manually, you can turn on some crosshairs so you have something to aim at. Uh, you can tell it to plate solve. There's a plate solve current image. So, yeah. So we've got our image in focus. Let me stop the um, loop, uh, which by the way, if you're using Nina and it won't let, let you take a picture in like Flats Wizard or somewhere else, check if you're <laughs> if you set this to, to loop because it won't take a picture somewhere else if you're already using the camera. Um, preparing for this workshop today, I was like, why in the world can't I take a picture? Uh, it's because of that. All right. So um, we're focused, ready to take some flats. Flat Wizard is really cool. Uh, if you haven't used it, it's really straightforward. It gives you good hints when things are going poorly. But, and it has this you know, slew to zenith. It makes it easy. Like Just point your scope up and pick which side of the pier or your, um, yeah, the pier to go to. If you have multiple filters, you can run them here. So if you have a filter wheel, um, you can run all your filters or subsets of the filters. Uh, if you're running one filter, you could tell it which one. I'll pick the UV, well, no, UV IR cut. Uh, one thing I changed from the defaults, the only thing I change is the histogram mean target. Uh, I drop it down a notch to 40%. I don't think that really matters, 40, 50. I've used both, but I like 40. Um, I guess the only thing I'm missing is I, I need to set up a panel. So I've got a tracing tablet. Um, it was like 18 bucks on Amazon. And it's got three sheets of paper on the tablet. And I've just dimmed it as much as I can because it's pretty bright in here already, and it's with the UVI or cut, not a narrow band. And then just hit the play button. And this will go kind of fast, but it's trying to find uh, the right exposure time. Uh, if you look on the bottom, you can see the target exposure is a third of a second. And it's using is one of one filters, and it's taking each of those exposures now. It's on the ninth of 10, 10 of 10, and it's going to be done in just a second. And it's done, that's it, flats are done. Um, assuming I wanted a third of a second flats, but uh, the dark flats are dark flats, or I hate this term, they're darks that match your flats exposure settings. So they're darks for your flats. So load them as darks if you if you need, wanted to. Uh, Useful if you have if you're using this for like a DSLR where you can't have a dark library, you could set it up to you know take darks for your flats right afterwards. It'll prompt you to um, cover the lens, um, and we'll just churn away taking taking the darks for you as well. And everything's saved. Uh, the target name is Flat Wizard. I don't think that gets saved anywhere, but um, if you want to know where they were saved, we go to Options, Imaging, and this is where you told Nina, or the default right now, but you can change it, uh, the location for all files. So let's load that up. And so remember, I changed it to have the date underscore prefix. So that's there for the directory first layer. Then it's, uh, let me scroll this down. Okay. So image type. So this example was lights. Well, they were flat. So it says flat, cool. And then all the files, all the fit files, they're here. Um, you could, oh, well, this one has the name of the filter in there. So UVIR, 
um, the exposure time, sequence number, et cetera. So, you know, customize this to whatever your needs are. Um, okay, so we've got flats. We are ready to set up a sequence for our target, though if any questions or something else within this stuff we've already covered, we want to dive into a little more. Naveen, I have one question for you. Yes, sir. Um, do you typically, um, when you're getting set up at night, do you have Nina on a laptop at your telescope? I have Nina on a mini PC on my telescope. Okay. Um, my question is, is I typically have to be outside with my equipment and I'm concerned about Nina. I don't use it yet. And so I'm concerned that because of kind of some vision issues, the, the type looks pretty small all over the, the screen. Some of the things look pretty small in a 19-inch monitor. Is that going to be something that's going to be a problem? Um, just taking a look here. I, I, I don't know that you can change. Right, let me try just control plus and see if that does anything. No. Um, so I'm on a 24-inch monitor right now. On a 19 inch, it would look probably a little bit bigger. There's probably accessibility options within the OS that that could help with the size. Otherwise, I, I don't know what would change it. There, I, I didn't cover this, but there's also colors. Um, so you can make things pop a little better. I personally don't like this light one. I usually run this one, I think, but it's a little darker for a presentation. Um, there's even high contrast, which if, if you might want to squint your eyes real quick, but this is pretty, pretty good <laughs> contrast. <laughs> um, so there's some options, Mark, but I don't know about the font. Okay. Yeah. Cause my laptops is like, a, you know, I can't remember. It's a 15 inch laptop. And mm -hmm. so I'm just afraid that, that all these things that you're showing are, are going to be pretty tiny and extremely hard to read. It, re it does a good job of resizing. That's one, actually one of the beefs I have with Nina's. If I, if I remote into the uh, computer from, I have a laptop I keep downstairs, which is closer to the scope. If I switch from that to my desktop, the resolutions of the screens are different and everything resizes. And Nina takes like 10, 15 seconds to wake up maybe longer sometimes because it, it's laying out everything dynamically. Um, I, I think, just throw it on your laptop and just see what it looks like. Um, and again, look at the accessibility options with um, it. So Nina requires Windows. Uh, I didn't mention that at the beginning. But um, yeah, if, if you're able to run it, just see if there's some way to, to make everything bigger. Because I think there's some magnifying glass capabilities that Windows has that can make things easier to read. OK, thanks. Yep. OK. Any, any other things or, well, we can always go back and talk about other stuff too, if you have questions that pop up. Um, I've clicked on the sequencer tab here on the left. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I've not used anything except for the advanced sequencer. Uh, there's an option if you do use Nina and you like the advanced sequencer, which I recommend you do like it because it's amazing. Uh, you can make it the default, I think somewhere, like it won't even prompt you anymore. Where is that? Uh, disable simple sequencer. So you could turn off the simple sequencer. And then if you click, when you click on sequencer, it just doesn't prompt you with this stuff. Uh, but I'm going to go into advanced sequencer now. Okay. Now I don't have something prepared. I am going to wing this. I've got some notes. Uh, if you have questions about something or want me to change it up, shout it out, please. I uh, can make this whatever the group wants to see. But I'm going to just start with the first thing. I, I'm going to cool my camera. Uh, one of the things that, like, there's a lot of instructions over here on the right-hand side, if, you know, I'm scrolling through. It can be hard to find exactly what you want. They're grouped like any telescope-related stuff under telescope. But I don't want to find it. So I can just type cool. And there it is, cool camera. And you just click and drag it over. Now, Nina has three areas in here. There's the startup, 
the, the main sequence target area, and then an end area. You don't have to use them. It's just to help you organize your stuff. It doesn't actually matter because it'll just go top to bottom. Um, well, speaking of the end area and the start, I'm going to also grab, we'll, we'll just do camera. We'll warm the camera up when we're done because we want to. And it's pretty chill tonight, so probably minus 10C will work well uh, for this camera. Um, let's see. We said, OK, so we've got it cooling down, and we want to do a target. So there's a instruction set up here called a deep sky object sequence. Um, well, before I do that, there's a templates tab. And you can create your own custom templates. I can show that uh, in a bit. But there's some basic sequences here, which I honestly, I don't think I've used for ever. Uh, but you can customize. You can have, as I mentioned, I have um, templates for various filters. And I have templates for my setup, for my teardown everything. Um, so instructions. I want a deep sky object. Uh, it starts blank. So I go over to targets. We we chose be beehive cluster earlier. Um, I can just grab that target and drop it over here. And it's now the target. It sets the name. It sets the RA deck and the rotation. Um, as I mentioned before, there was a way to, you, when you're saving a target, you're saving it to a template. So if you like that feature, you can drag this into the instruction area without going to the deep sky target. And it will create, based on the template you picked, all the stuff that was in there. But I'm not going to go through that. Um, but that can be really useful if you want to use the exact same sequence of steps to image a target night overnight. So I'm going to delete that. So this is how you can delete a little trash can. OK. So let's see. <clears throat> I want to wait for the sun to go down. So we'll just wait if sun altitude is greater than minus 18 degrees. Um, I want to, well, maybe another wait. So we'll search for wait. I want to wait for my target's altitude. So I don't want to start anything until it's high enough to see. Or uh, my you know, try to image at 40 degrees, assuming the target is above 40. Um, all right, so after those weights, I um, want to start tracking, just to make sure the mount's actually tracking. And I'm going to assume I'm pointed at the sky. So I'm going to run an autofocus, just to kick it off and make sure things are in focus. And OK, so we're focused. Now we need to acquire our target. So we'll slew. Let's see, there's a bunch of options for slewing. Um, slew and center is generally what I use because of my setups I've already rotated. But for this, we'll go slew, center, and rotate. So this will slew the mount to uh, the desired location. It will use plate solving to center the target and plate solving to rotate. Uh, and if you have the manual rotator, uh, it'll just prompt you and say, you need to rotate counterclockwise x degrees or you know, count, uh, counterclockwise or clockwise y degrees or whatever. Uh, it's, and it'll, it'll then plate solve again, check it. And if, then once it's within the tolerances you've set, which by default was one degree of rotation, it'll move on. That's uh, pretty slick. Um, let's see here. So we've centered, we've rotated, we're on the target. Let's start guiding. So start guiding. All right. Now, I don't want to do any of this stuff again, but I want to take a lot of pictures. 
So I'm going to create a instruction set, a sequential instruction set. So it'll just run whatever instructions I put in here, one after the other, and then do it again, assuming the loop conditions are met. I want to just take pictures. So let's take an exposure. And there's a couple ways you can do this. There's um, many exposures, so you could take, you know, a bunch of exposures in a set. I actually, let me just pull those in. Um, smart exposure. I have not played with take subframe exposure. Let's look at that. Why not? Um, probably don't want to use all of these, but you know, pick your poison. I tend to use smart exposure because it gives me the most flexibility and I just have one thing to think about. Like how many exposures, two by default, the time, well, let's change that to 30. Uh, it's a light. Uh, I'm not going to bin, uses the default gain, default offset, my current filter. Well, let's, let's not do that. Let's pick a filter, UVIR, and dither every one. Sure, so let's, let's take 10 exposures and dither every 10. Um, take exposure is the simplest one. It doesn't bundle in you know, multiple exposures and changing filters and dithering. Many exposures, well, it adds many exposures, but no filter change or dithering. Take subframe exposure. What does this do? I have a mount tooltip. No tooltip. All right, yeah. I have no idea what that's doing. Uh, Anybody? Uh, Naveen, I think that's for taking just a, uh, an area from the picture, because you can take ah. a region of interest. Ah, nice. Yeah. OK. That's cool. That could be interesting. Um, yeah, maybe to crop out part of a, a frame that you know is going to be have coma or you know, not flat stars that you don't want. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'm actually I'm gonna say I usually use smart exposure, but I'm gonna I'm gonna use the take exposure, the simplest form. And we'll take these other three out. Um, so I've got to do the things that that smart exposure did. So let's change filters. Uh, so switch filter. Want to do that here. It's okay to if I'm looping through and doing this a whole bunch of times, it, it won't change. It won't prompt me unless the filter's changed. I think this is probably good to do inside the loop in case I stop the sequence and do something manually and change the filter out and forget. It would be bad to, you know, spend hours on a target with the wrong filter. Um, Pretty useful too with the, the uh, electronic filter where you can change it up there. Let's see, what else? Oh, dithering. Dithering. Oh, God. Dither. Um, so with dither, I've got, I can in the instructions just say dither, or I can use a trigger. Triggers are things that happen based on some criteria. So I'm going to use the trigger. And that allows me to dither after some number of exposures. Um, I typically dither every five to 10 exposures, depends on, or sorry, uh, minutes, um, just the way I do it. I mean, so for this setup with 30 seconds, I do, I'll dither it at 10 exposures. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so now we've got initial setup, switch the filters, we're taking exposures, we've got dithering. Um, it's going to get colder as the night goes on, so we probably want to add some uh, focus, autofocus runs in here. Uh, so instead of always going to the instructions, there's all these plus symbols over here that help um, add in stuff. So if I want to trigger, on, uh, trigger an autofocus periodically, I can hit the plus. So autofocus after exposures, filter change, HFR, increase temperature or time. Uh, my preference is temperature and time. So I like, I, 
I started with 0.8 degrees centigrade and I don't remember why and I haven't changed it and it seems to be working. So that's what I do. Um, I also like time just in case, you know, it's been a while. I, I want to just focus every hour and a half, even if temperature hasn't changed. It doesn't take that much time. And then there's other triggers. There's one specifically I want to call out because I didn't know about this for quite a while and it's amazing. Uh, restore guiding. If your guiding fails or is stopped, this trigger will restart it if it can. Um, so put it in, restore guiding, really useful. And I noticed Meridian flip, that's important too. I wanna to make sure we flip. Um, I think that's, oh, center after drift is another one I'll call out that's pretty interesting. Um, this will evaluate a number of exposures uh, and see if you're drifting off center. And if you are, it will stop things, recenter, and then resume. Um, I've had this happen when guiding has failed because of clouds and it just, it kind of goes all over the place. It goes a little insane for a while. Um, so the frame ends up like half of the sensor off of where I wanted it to be. This will catch that and bring it back. So you don't lose the rest of the night or the rest of that target's images. You lose maybe, well, whatever you set here. So um, five might lose five images. Um, and then eh, I don't know what I would set this to, but you can set the tolerances here. Well, Naveen, Steve here, I assume that has to be greater than whatever your maximum dither, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't want dithers to cause this to trigger. All right. Yeah. This is more, yeah, as I said, it's for the extreme case of your guiding when insane. I've, I've actually had this um, work for me on, on one night there was, you know, a cloud that passed through the frame. My guiding went insane, um, moved stuff like, like there was two, two to five images that where everything was shifted over half the sensor. And then this fired and brought it back. It was really cool. Is, so is there... Go ahead. So you couldn't uh, you really couldn't use this if you were you had a small amount of field rotation and uh, it, it a field rotation should be okay because it's looking at the center of the field. It, it it's not a re oh. it's center after drift. It's not a rotate. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The does the restore guiding or something in here, is there something in here that would say suspend the loop that you're taking uh, if you lose the guiding uh, somewhere in the middle of it? I don't know of anything offhand, but my head goes to the safety monitor. Maybe there's some way there. Like if you set up some, uh, I, I don't know anything about that space. Um, if you go to equipment, safety monitor. Yeah, I know the old version or the, the currently, I'll call it official version, has an option that will abort to the image sequence that you're taking if the guider loses, loses mm -hmm. sync or stops guiding. And I was just curious if there were something in here that would do the equivalent of that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know of one, but let's scroll through real quick. Um, I assume that'd be part of Guider, which is right here. So dither, dither after exposures, restore, start and stop. I don't, um, let's see here. Loop conditions, maybe. Loop for iterations, no. Let's see if there's triggers. Actually, yeah, we looked at the triggers here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I don't, I don't see anything, Steve. I don't, I don't know that it can. Um, yeah, I think the safety monitor is probably what you would be looking at, which I haven't played with. Um, I basically just keep taking pictures and toss the bad ones once everything comes back because 
otherwise you're you're putting in logic of like i don't even know how you <laughs> how you would oh, pause I, and yeah. have it start again understand i don't use that but i could see yeah. where that could be useful because i'm normally like mark i'm out there with the with the machine if the guider goes nuts then i can go pause the sequence but yeah it, yeah now and, and as far as like guider going nuts and slewing all over the place i just throw it out there like um if, if you haven't seen that happen it's not like your mount is going all over the sky and moving radically it's it's very small it's still within the field of view of what you're imaging um at, at least from the few times i've had it happen which is yeah what what happens amusing. in my case when i lose lose the guiding because of the clouds or something comes in it just sort of tends to drift and drift off or whatever, but it would, it would sure be nice if that happens just to be able to stop the sequence and wait and yeah. restart it. Yeah. The, the simple one, I don't think will restart, but this one looks like it has the, the capability to restart that if that happens. But the question is how do you stop it? So you don't just sit there and take junk. Yeah. You have to throw out. Yeah. Um, Someday I'll look into the safety monitors. I think that may be a way to trigger. There's got to be something I like. I just don't know. But the other option is you have this center after drift. Uh, so you can recover from that. Um, and then, yeah, you've taken a bunch of pictures, but oh, well. Uh, let's see. Have we covered everything we need here? Oh, loop. Yeah. When to exit this loop? So either. It, you know the sun's coming up or the target is set so let's let's cover that loop conditions uh there's a lot of options um uh you can you know loop a number of iterations or for a period of time uh loop until alt, uh, altitude altitude is below something so for this target i'd say below 40 degrees um they just recently added this bit here um which is really slick so for this target for tonight it will be at 40 degrees at about 12 12 19 a.m which is pretty cool I, I really like that the other let's see there's loop while ab above horizon so as i said i had the um uh horizon loaded in to nina we could see that in the uh, sky atlas and well we can see it here too in the in the target um, you can actually you can loop until uh, you've hit that horizon as well which is useful when it's so i like the image above 40 degrees uh, but if there's like a tree or a house roof i don't want to customize my templates so if i have both of these in place if it once it hits one of those conditions either it's hit the horizon like a roof or it hits 40 degrees, it'll it'll abort the uh, sequence for this target, which is really slick. And you can give it an offset too. But, um, <laughs> and it's saying, yeah, now it's below the horizon now, <laughs> obviously. Um, let's see. Oh, and uh, Steve, these may be kind of related to what you're talking about: the loop while safe or while unsafe. So you might be able to do something with nested. Um, sequences or instruction sets to do something with the safety monitor if you've lost guiding. Uh, but that, I don't know how custom that might need to be. Um, the other one, loop and, okay, sun. We don't want to image if the sun is rising. So if it's above 18 degrees, minus 18 degrees, sorry, we will abort. Yes, it is now above the horizon. <laughs> Uh, da, 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 da. I think that's it. Oh, okay. okay. Let. Yeah, yes. I was gonna say that uh, you can also use loop until time with the uh, dawn and dusk if you, instead of sun if you want to. Um, yes, and actually that's a good point. There's there's a hidden um, loop until time is not what you would think like yes you can pick a time when it would stop looping but it also as you mentioned sunset nautical dust all these things and meridian uh, which is neat you could actually like just have it stop 
when it's about to do a meridian flip and do something. I don't know what, but I've I've used this when there's some plugins I use now, but a while ago I was using this to just stop a target um, a little bit early to move to the next target because uh, it was you know the two targets were roughly you know when it when the first one was hitting meridian the next one was above its uh, obstructions and 40 degrees. So. Um, but yeah, that one's kind of hidden. It's not obvious. Um, all right, so we have all this and it would be terrible to lose it. So let's save it. There's two options. Uh, there's save a new sequence. So this little plus symbol on this um, floppy disk. All the kids will be like, what is that? Um, and then this one, which is just to save it without giving it a new name. So I, since this hasn't been saved yet, it doesn't matter which one. Click that guy. I named mine based on the day. Um, and I'll call this one workshop, so I'm not confused later. And it renames the uh, sequence based on the file name initially. But you can change that to anything you want later. And now we can. You know, we could load it back in if we want and reference it for, you know, if you've, you're imaging this target a couple nights from now or something, you're like, what did I do the previous night? You have it all here in front of you. I mentioned saving your own templates as well. Um, so if we like this sequence and we want to use this sequence again for other targets, there's a smaller save current instruction set, all of its contents as a template for reusage. So you click that guy, and it's it's named whatever was named here, but that's fine. So then you can go to templates, and it's a user template. And you can just grab that, pull it in, and it doesn't have a target initially, but then you can grab, you know, if it's Beehive again or some other target. It has all the instructions we had saved before. Um, and you can actually do that for sub instruction sets. Um, so if you have something that's in a larger set of instructions that you might want to pull out and do a kind of a ad hoc on occasion, that could be useful. Um, I set up a sequence for taking my flats because I, I know the exposure time for my flats. So I have a sequence that does that for me. So I don't have to stop a sequence, go over to the flat wizard, get flats, and then come back. It's all part of one big sequence. But I save that off as a separate um, sequence sometimes, because maybe I I need to do it, you know, in the middle of the night for some reason, like I was doing some testing after doing initial setup. But anyway, it's it's really flexible. So I could actually let's let's do this. Let's say um, take pictures. So I can just save this as a new sequence. And now I can grab that. And just that chunk is now pulled in. It doesn't have a target. So this center and drift doesn't know what to do, um, which is nice. Nina will tell you when devices aren't connected or it can't do whatever you're trying to tell it to do. I'll delete those two. Um, and I collapse this without mentioning, but it these things can get rather large, and it's nice to be able to hide them. And you can duplicate it. You're like, all right, I want to go from Beehive to the Leo triplet. I can just duplicate that and pull in if I, if I had another target. Just pull in a different target and you know tweak it if needed. All right. Habit always save. Um, one other thing here I just wanted to hit real quick is parallel sequences or parallel instruction sets. So at the end of the night, I don't want my camera pointed at whatever it was already pointed at and still slewing because um, it's just going to keep going. Like the telescope, it could be bad. So I want to park my scope and I've had kind of iffy experiences with park. It will, I use um, EQ mod usually. It parks, but doesn't. It always throws up a warning saying it didn't do it, but it actually works. 
But if I try to park and then unpark, I have to wait at least 15 seconds before it'll actually honor the unpark. But anyway, so I want to do these. So while I'm cooling, I might as well be parking the, the scope at the same time. There's no reason to wait. So we'll do a parallel instruction set here and just grab those guys and drag them in. So you can drag and drop all your stuff around. And now these will run in parallel and the sequence of this instruction set will exit when both of them have completed. And then the sequence will be over for this particular example. All right. That is what I was wanting to cover with the advanced sequencer. There's a lot this thing can do. Um, yeah. <laughs> the the sky's the limit on how complicated your sequences get, depending on what you want to do. Um, any any questions? I, I'd like to talk a little bit about plugins as well, because they're a huge piece of the latest Nina updates. But anything on the sequencer? All right, plugins. So the last tab. Uh, I have two installed right now uh, because to install a plugin, it's quick, it's easy, but you have to reboot Nina. It, the list of available plugins is in this little available icon. And I haven't used, I've used maybe a third of these, if, if that much, I'm not sure anymore. There, more and more plugins pop up all the time. Um, so I'm just I'm going to run through a few that I found useful. Um, if anybody else has experience with plugins and wants to speak about them, I'd love to learn about uh, how you're using other plugins. Um, and I'm going to install them as I go, the ones that I use, because I need to anyway. Uh, the connector plugin, I'll click install, and it's done. Um, it says require restart here. Uh, if you click the requires restart, it'll just restart Nina. So I'm not going to do that. Um, this one allows you to disconnect and connect equipment as a part of your sequence. Uh, there was a while, and I, I flip flop between using SharpCap and uh, Nina's three point, um, uh, what is it called? Three point alignment uh, plugin for polar alignment. Um, so I had in a sequence until coming back to Nina for polar alignment to disconnect my camera, tell me to finish the sharp cap polar alignment. And then there was a, a message box, you know, click OK. And then would reconnect the camera and start cooling. Uh, so that can be really useful. I'll give a shout out to this constants for exposures. I haven't played with this yet, but this one sounds interesting. If you change up your exposure times or settings for taking exposures, um, a good bit. It gives you a way to just set some constants and then reuse those throughout a bunch of uh, instructions. So this one seems cool. I, just, I haven't used it yet. Darks Customs is terribly named, but a very good plugin. It will build, um, it'll, it'll take run through all your filters and do auto focusing, uh, run it as many times as you tell it to, and it'll figure out filter offsets. Uh, really useful for uh, filter wheels. Um, I wish they'd change the name. Uh, let's see here, Hocus Focus, install that guy. Uh, Michael Fulbright put a thread into the imaging list recently about this plugin, and uh, it has become pretty solid from a focusing perspective. It works really well. It parallelizes a lot of the instructions or the processing that the default Nina does, as well as has customizable uh, star detection and improved star detection. So you can tweak it for your setup. Uh, stock Nina focusing doesn't have that. And the newest thing that um, was mentioned is the um, aberration inspector, which I played with, I think it was last weekend, just to see what my, how bad my scope's uh, tilt and back fo focus was, but uh, which it's not bad, but 
it, that's a really neat feature. Um, Patriot Astro on YouTube has a, uh, which is what Michael uh, linked in the email thread, has a really good video that goes over all the things you need to know about Hocus Focus. Uh, highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, moon angle is interesting. I don't, I think it's part of Nina now to tell you how far away the moon is, but you can also get, uh, so the plugins can add instructions for you. So you could say, um, you know, abort or, you know, stop a sequence or stop a target if the moon becomes within a certain uh, number of degrees. Uh, I have no idea how to pronounce this one, but this is one of my favorites. Uh, this one allows you to start, install that. Uh, set loop conditions based on your next target. So I can say, like, if, if my current target is not my main target for the night, I don't have to do the math and figure out when my next target's going to rise and then do a wait until time. I can say, when my next target is above 40 degrees, I need to stop my current target and move to that one. So it's it's really slick, and it also has um, you know uh, horizon as well. I haven't played with the Pix Insight tools, but I think it's something to do with stacking. Yeah, live stacking. Yeah. Uh, what else? Um, I added already the exposure calculator, which we talked about, and then three point polar alignment. Uh, you mentioned sharp cap. I, I like sharp cap as well, but this is really cool. It's a little bit, uh, don't take the default settings for this if you use it, um, but it, it is pretty good. It, 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 you tell it where to start and how many degrees to move between pictures and it takes three frames. So start, middle and end. And then it shows you what's on the screen right now, you know, how far you need to move uh, to be perfectly polar aligned. Um, it works pretty well. And I'll pop over to the imaging tab. It's the last plugin in the list. Pop over to the got a question about that. The, uh, sure. The polar, uh, three point polar alignment. Uh, I didn't look at, I just noticed that and, uh, like a, a week ago, looking at, looking just reading through your website there. Um, when I say notice, I just read it. And, uh, what I'm getting at is. Do they care what's uh, part of the sky you're pointing your uh, scope at, or does it have to be aimed at polar north like like you would with sharp cap? No, it doesn't matter. Okay, so it can it kind of does drift alignment for you, kind of. Yep, yep. So if you can't see Polaris from wherever you're imaging, you could use this, no problem. Oh, that's really nice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that helped a lot. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there are some locations I have that have a really nice southern horizon, but the northern one just sucks. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, I will say when you're the thing that I've had a problem with with this plugin is because you're not your your scope's probably not going to be pointed north if you're doing this plugin. It's going to be off. So you're going to have less of the sky that you can slew through. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so one, be aware of that Two, be careful um, because you also, you set, you set the direction. So, okay, let me just walk through this really quick. Um, I don't know what manual mode does. I haven't played with that, but the, the point distance is the degrees that it will move between each image. Mm -hmm. So if you say 90 degrees, that would be 180 degree total move. So don't do that. Um, the rate of speed three by default is really slow. So don't use the defaults. They're, they're not good in my experience. Um, you could say from my current location, start, and then maybe you, you know, let's say 40 degree changes. Um, what I've done is I've slewed Let's see, I get polar aligned first, and then well, probably with sharp cap, we could use this carefully and then slew to manually slew to something that looks like I could then slew about 90 degrees total. Um, and then read 
what the altitude and azimuth is and plug that into my sequence. Um, generally, I'm trying to, you know, from part from pointing at the, you know, celestial north pole, try and slew east um, and just try to, yeah, yeah, try to mimic what I would do manually if I, if I could with, um, sharp cap now if you don't have a view of polaris again like it, it doesn't care so just point it at whatever makes sense but just make sure that you're not gonna you know have any unfortunate collisions as you slew okay um, very good yeah but it, it works I, it works really well at least i i've tried it reasonably close to polaris not not directly at it but within like probably 10 to 20 degrees um it's worked well. Oh, I used it once where I was pointing basically east because the Polaris was covered by trees and seemed to work pretty well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Um, one of the nice things about this, as I mentioned, these plugins give you a uh, instruction you can use. So I can put that into my sequence. And you know, polar align while my camera is cooling down or whatever, um, and have a repeatable thing where I don't have to remember the settings. It's it's really convenient. I don't know why? Oh, my scope is my fake scope is parked. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we mentioned the optimal exposure calculator. Other plugins have panes that can show up in the imaging tab as well as the instructions they add. Uh, and as I, there's a ton that I, I haven't used. Uh, well, I've, I've read through some of them, but I just like I want to play with the smart Meridian flips. I've got a longer scope right now. Um, with a tripod, it's a little risky for some targets. But um, yeah, there's more and more popping out all the time. They're really cool capabilities. So Nina has become extensible, which is neat. Oh, another honorable mention, synchronization. If you, um, if you do, if you have two imaging rigs, like you're piggybacking or something, you can use synchronization uh, to coordinate um, dithering between two instances of Nina running on the same computer, which is uh, cool. I haven't tried it yet, but. Okay. Anybody else have a like a plugin might want to talk about? Oh, well, orbitals is also interesting if you want to take the pictures of the comets or uh, meteors or the J J's James Lab space station. Okay. He has a, even a sequence specifically for that one. Cool. Thank you. Oh yeah, planets, sun, moon, comets, asteroids, <laughs> James Webb Space Telescope, nice. All right, I have hit the end of my list of stuff I wanted to cover about Nina. Um, Veen, um, back to the basics, there's one, I, when you're, I'm looking for a, uh, a star to focus on. Well, in Nina, um, you can pick um, some stars to uh, to to go to do that, and uh, you really can't do that right directly from ASTAP. But I don't know. I thought that was useful. I'm I'm not up to the you know the complexity that you have here. But I uh, do you do you use framing? Uh, to... Imaging tab has a manual focus list. Yes, that's that's correct. It's yeah, I think you have to toggle on the right. It's one of those icons on the top right. Okay. Yes. Manual focus. Oh, okay, I haven't played with that. Oh, that is sweet. Yeah, you can pick. Uh, it is oh. nice. Yeah, and that'll that'll then be using plate solving to make automatically center it for you. Oh, exactly. That is, that yeah. is slick. Yeah, I found that very useful. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Yeah, there's I've actually used the framing to 
put a star in so I could use it as a target. But this, yeah, I'll use this now. <laughs> That's great. Oh, and it's actually the current altitude in azimuth. Um, so you can pick something that works for right now. All right. Great. I guess you could also use that, uh, although maybe um, if you're doing a calibration for you want to be like uh, at 20 degrees, you know, away, you know, away from uh, the uh, you want to be you don't want to be too close to the uh, pole star. So that may be helpful on picking a star or getting into an area you want to you want to be in to do the calibration. Calibration for like PhD or? Yeah, yeah. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. But... I've, I've got a, a template I've saved off where I basically, I, you know, did the manual slew thing and you know, it's um, back over my house at roughly declination zero. So I can always have a, a place to point at. Yep. All right. Any other questions? I, I can I can feel this like how I use Nina for certain things. I mean whatever. Nope. Okay figure out how to bring back the uh, menu pane from Zoom. That oh, man. I don't Zoom very often. Hmm. Does anybody know if there's a keyboard shortcut for that? The hid in the top. What are you trying to do? Unshare? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I can't. I don't have an unshare option. I hid the little bar that showed up on my screen because it was in the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> usually, what I do is I hit. Well, I can always unshare you if you want. <laughs> oh, that would be fine too. Thank <laughs> you. Well, darn it! Now I just put that up. Um, now it's doing my share. Okay. There we go. All right. <laughs> So, Thanks. So, okay. Uh, well, I guess that's it. Um, Navina, I want to thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is something I've been wanting to look into for a while instead of just, you know, bouncing back and forth between uh, the, uh, uh, a planetarium program, PhD, and uh, uh, a uh, focus or plugin and a uh, and shark tab all at once. It's just it's kind of annoying. I was just thinking, well, this is probably be a no-brainer right here just to go ahead and get started using. So anyway, all right. Um, yeah, uh, I guess we'll we'll call it a meeting. Well, it wasn't a meeting, we'll call it a workshop then. So <laughs> so yeah, right. thanks again, Naveen. And uh, we'll talk to you guys uh, next month or actually in about two weeks uh, for our uh, Orion uh, Nebula Imaging uh, Challenge. So, all right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. That was fun. Thank you, Naveen. Thank Take you, care. Naveen. Thanks, Naveen. It was great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Naveen. Thank you.